ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय यही संस्पर्श जा भोगा दुख यो नय एव थे आद्यंत बंत कौन थे या न तेशु रमते बुद्ध हा An intelligent person does not take part in the sources of misery which are due to contact with the material senses. O son of Kunti, such pleasures have a beginning and an end and so the wise man does not delight in them. Purport Material sense pleasures are due to the contact of the material senses, which are all temporary because the body itself is temporary. A liberated soul is not interested in anything which is temporary. Knowing well the joys of transcendental pleasures, how can a liberated soul agree to enjoy false pleasure? In the Padma Purana it is said, Ramante yogino nante satyananda chidatmani iti ramapade na so. Param Brahma Vidhiyate The mystics derive unlimited transcendental pleasures from the Absolute Truth and therefore the Supreme Absolute Truth, the Personality of Godhead, is also known as Rama. In the Srimad Bhagavatam also it is said, Nayam Deho Deha Bhajang Nriloke Kashtan Kaman Arhate Vidbhujang Ye Tapo divyang putraka yena sattvang shud yed yasmad brahmaso kyam tvanantam. My dear sons, there is no reason to labor very hard for sense pleasure while, it, while in this human form of life such pleasures are available to the stool eaters, hogs. Rather, you should undergo penances in this life by which your existence will be purified and as a result, you will be able to enjoy unlimited transcendental bliss. Therefore, those who are true yogis or learned transcendentalists are not attracted by sense pleasures which are the causes of continuous material existence. The more one is addicted to material pleasures, the more he is entrapped by material miseries. So the uh, the truth told here by Krishna forms the basis of spiritual life. It is very basic teaching. We could ask who's chanting to chant elsewhere. Even for chanting this time, place and circumstance. It, this instruction is not in itself spiritual. It doesn't define what is spiritual or give any instruction about the nature of the spiritual. But it shows what is not spiritual. In that way, indirectly, by negation. This uh, instruction is wholly non-understandable to most people in the world, even though it's the most basic spiritual instruction or the basis from which spiritual instruction can begin to be understood. But it is not, is not communicable to most, the great majority of persons in material life in, because they are convinced just the opposite. Material existence means to be attracted to sangsparsha bhoga, enjoyment, not pleasure, enjoyment. Enjoyment from touch, sparsha means touch and implied here is not only not only touching but tasting, smelling, seeing, feeling, thinking, all the various interactions 
of the senses with the sense objects. So this gives enjoyment, but not pleasure. Pleasure is something else. Enjoyment means the uh, that which is enjoyed, the interaction of the immaterial existence. The, the enjoyment means the interaction of the senses with the sense objects with the expectation that it will give pleasure. But, as Lord Krishna points out here, it is actually the cause of suffering. It's very difficult for materialistic people to understand because they are uh, attracted by the Lord's illusory energy by which they equate the interaction of the senses with sense objects with pleasure. It is a it gives a sensation which to which appears to be like pleasure. And it is pleasure but it is a very inferior quality of pleasure and it's always accompanied by distress. This a wise person sees. Buddha. An, in, an intelligent person sees this. An intelligent, even uh, without being instructed in this, even without approaching a guru, someone who's intelligent in the true sense of the term, intelligence in the truest sense means not necessarily the ability to uh, solve mathematical riddles or play chess or read and write. But in the truest sense of the term, intelligence means to discriminate between that which is actually beneficial and that which is not. That which is real and that which is not. That is true intelligence. Otherwise, even the animals have some kind, in some ways, are more intelligent than human beings. Some anim, some arctic terns, one kind of bird, they have the intelligence to fly from the North Pole to the South. Well, ar, from the Arctic Circle to the Antarctic Circle, every year they fly up and back. So they don't have any inbuilt. They don't have any radar or maps. But they fly up and they fly backwards and forwards. They have that intelligence. The ants have the intelligence to find sugar. If you drop a grain of sugar, the ants will find it very soon. I don't know, if probably not here, but in India certainly if you drop some sugar, you'll find a whole trail of ants within 10 minutes. You know, a trail of ants or if, if some fly falls down dead, then within 10 minutes there'll be a, a gang of ants dragging it back to their, 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 their natural garbage service, garbage removal service. So they find, they find it, they have the intelligence to do so. So even, even the very insignificant animals or, or insects, the bees, they construct uh, engineering marvels called inside their bee, the honeycomb. So they have intelligence, but they're not the intelligence to discriminate between what is for their ultimate good. The animals being controlled wholly by the modes of material nature have no sense they have no, it, it's not inherent in the psychophysical makeup of the animals to have the intelligence to discriminate between that which is for their ultimate good because they can only identify with their body. They cannot even begin to think that they are anything else. And for most human beings, the same case applies. Therefore, most people are like animals because they cannot... They, Cannot, even by attempting to explain to them, there's so much identifying with their, their sense of I-ness, their ego, that I am the body, that they cannot perceive 
We can't imagine anything beyond that. So, human life, well, there are different uh, measures of where human life begins. Human civilization begins with Varnashram Dharma because it's supposed to lead to this kind of discrimination. But in the in the lower stages of Varnashram, or, or the in Varnashram which is followed by yeah, those who follow Varnashram and who don't go beyond that, in, in the Karma Kanda section, they are in a sophisticated manner indulging in their animalistic propensities. So jnana begins with the understanding yehi sangsparsha bhoga dukha yone evate that sense enjoyment, even that in the heavenly planets is simply a cause of suffering. And then comes the question atato brahma jignyasa having concluded that sense enjoyment either here on this planet or in, even in the heavenly planets is simply a form of suffering. There is, then therefore, we must, we must inquire further what, what is the ultimate reality. Reality is not enjoying the senses, either as a bee or an ant or an arctic tern or a demigod in heaven, but this is this is not a cause of in, of pleasure. Is enjoyment the interaction of the senses with the sense objects? But nateshu ramate buddha, those who are actually intelligent, they don't try to find pleasure in this, knowing that the pleasure that is there, it's uh, like a drop of water in the desert. Hmm. The, the Prabhupada used to quote the Dapati. What is that? That, that uh, Tartala Saikate, Vari Bindu Sama, Sutamita Ramani Samaji, Samaja. That the pleasure of society, friendship, and love is like that of a getting a drop of water if you're in a burning desert. And you want, you require so much water, and someone brings one dropper. You want water? Here's water. <sighs> At last, I'll put out your tongue, and one drop. So it's it's pleasure, but it it's it is enjoyment, but it doesn't satisfy. It doesn't even begin to satisfy. There's a sense that this is what I want, but it's wholly insufficient to. Uh, for our requirement. So that example is given. There are many examples. Another example, that of taking uh, rice cooked in milk with sugar, what we call sweet rice, paramanna. So very tasty, boiled down milk with some saffron added, Offered to Krishna, we hope. It may be not. We well. There's one kind of sweet rice we don't. We shouldn't offer to Krishna. You don't bother cleaning the rice properly, and always you're eating up <coughs> some stone in there, some little pieces of grit. So it tastes nice, but the you can't enjoy it because <coughs> oh, the, the whole oh, the whole body trembles with this. Horrible sensation of biting the grit. So the, the sweet rice, which is full of sand, it's you're trying to enjoy it, but you can't enjoy it. It's, ah, it's, but you go on trying to enjoy it because it tastes nice, but ah, oh. So these are just examples, but actually, material life is severely a cause of suffering, birth and death. It's we talk, you know, yeah, but that old age disease. You know, it's, it's actually a cause of great suffering. Death is a cause, not only the, the uh, physical sensation of death, 
but the, the having to give up the attachment to the body and the fear of going what's on the other side. Death is and death is painful to others also. That when when now in Lebanon there's fighting going on and people are watching on the TV and it's horrible. It's so and people you see people are crying because their child got killed. And the pain of the suffering of separation from loved ones who we who we take to be. Uh, we take the relationship with them to be real, and when that is cut, so much suffering. So material life is full of distress, and we, we, but we try to increase our enjoyment to offset our distress. But it's it's making the situation worse. It's not making it better. We think let us let us make all arrangements for enjoyment. Now we shall have. Uh, mechanized slaughterhouses, so we can eat lots of meat. People like to eat meat, but prior to the 1950s, people didn't eat as much meat as they do today. Now there's, now they have, by the advancement of technology, mechanized uh, slaughterhouses and uh, refrigerated trucks, so you can drive it here and there, so that. When I when I was in England, when this body was growing up, there was the, the, one of the main foods very cheap was New Zealand lamb. Some little lamb was jumping around in a field in New Zealand and ended up on someone's plate in England on the other side of the world due to the advancement of modern technology. But little do they know that all of this produces karmic reactions and for inflicting the suffering on the animals human society has suffering inflicted on it and as Prabhupada several times said that there's uh, the atom bomb is just waiting for them, they think they can by making some peace treaties they can control it all but no, we cannot avoid suffering and death, that, that was famous that tsunami that word entered the vocabulary of millions of people in January 2005, was it? I think. January 2. So, a Japanese word. Otherwise, it was called a tidal wave or a tidal war in English. And then this word got adopted. I knew that word from Bangladesh where they had, they had a tidal wave about 19... Uh, well, they, had, they have them from time to time. <laughs> You visit the places afterwards and you say, oh, oh, well, uh, where's your father? Oh, he died in the, died in the tidal wave. Or like this. So, so many people get killed by that. So then they're wondering why it's so horrible and so many people got killed. But that the whole east, southeast coast of India is full of chicken farms. So they're killing so many chickens every day. And then and of course, the fishermen. So and one day, one morning, the people were out for their early walk on the beach and they didn't come back home. Well, they came, their bodies came back, but oh, they're, they're taken directly to the burning gat. If there was any burning gat left, I don't know exactly what happened to all the bodies. So they're surprised. Why is there so much suffering in the world? They're inflicting suffering and then wondering why they're suffering. They don't. It, 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 they don't consider that animals suffer by being killed. So we shouldn't do that. They don't think due to this. Maybe due to this interpretation of the Bible that God gave man dominion over the animals. Therefore, he should kill them and eat them. A very bad proposition. When Prabhupada was told this, he said, it's just that then if someone gives you their child to look, please look after my child. <laughs> and then you come back after a few hours. What happened to your child? So where's my child? Well, we looked after him. <laughs> we like children very much. So roasted and like this. Roasted children. Well, that lamb was someone's child also. 
You don't consider. So it's a very bad idea that man was given dominion over the animals by God means he should care for them, but they interpret he should kill them. So these are just examples. People don't realize. They don't see the connection. They're busy studying science, finding the connection between the different laws of nature, but they don't see this simple connection that if we perform activities for sense pleasure, then we have to suffer the consequence. They have an idea that, well, you can enjoy anything. The, 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 mod, the modern hedonistic society is based on the principles that we that we sh everyone should be allowed to pursue personal happiness as far as possible. Everyone should be given the freedom to do so as far as possible, as long as it doesn't cause distress to others. That's why they say, well, it's all right to be uh, homosexual because as long as it doesn't harm anyone else, then what does it matter? But they don't know that there are laws of nature that certain activities are by the laws of God, they are sinful because you're engaging in uh, sensual pleasure which has no... Uh, it, it's only sensual pleasure. It has no higher purpose. One is allowed, if one is on the lower level of uh, human life, the, in, following the Karmakanda section of the Vedas, one is allowed to enjoy sensual pleasure but not it should not only be harmless in what but it should also even the sense pleasure there should be some contribution to human society so otherwise it becomes sinful and there are levels of sin so to grossly enjoy the material body well that is allowable if that produces good offspring but if not, then it's sinful. So these are the laws of nature that people don't know and they don't accept and they don't want to accept because they're so much uh, addicted to the proposition of enjoying happiness through sense enjoyment. Although they're not happy. They can't see. Pashanapi na pashati. They see, they can see that the world's a complete social disaster. But they presume they still they're so puffed up they think yeah our society is better than at any time in previously because we allow freedom and that's the problem that they allow freedom <laughs> they think that allowing freedom is good but the freedom to commit sinful activities is uh, it's not at all beneficial for human society rather control is is preferable just like children they should be controlled not given complete freedom because if they if they're given freedom, they'll misuse it because they're not in knowledge. of. So children should be controlled. Of course, in modern society, they probably have the idea that children shouldn't be controlled and then they wonder why they grow up like animals because there's no transition from child or animal-like condition to human-like condition. Human means that, that he lives by intelligent discrimination. There's a higher level of intelligent discrimination. The beginning of that is mentioned in this verse. To discriminate between that which uh, that which gives us actual benefit, that which gives us actual pleasure, and that which doesn't. But even on the even on the level of sense enjoyment, there has to be some discrimination. Just they've they've brought it down to the level that enjoy sense gratification as much as you can, as long as it doesn't harm others. But they don't know what what is actual harm because they don't know the laws of nature, the subtle laws of nature. Or well, they say, as long as you don't harm others, you can harm the animals, mm -hmm. but don't harm human beings. That's all. So they have the idea that we should have liberty as much as possible. But the liberty to commit sinful activities is a great harm to human society. So this kind of liberty is not good. Liberty should be granted to persons who are uh, in knowledge of how to use it. If we're not in knowledge of how to use our liberty, then we'll misuse it, like children. So if there's not training in human society of the actual uh, purpose of life and the laws of nature as 
given in as given in Shastra, as given by the Supreme Lord, then in the name of giving liberty, we may think, well, we're all it's all very nice and we're all enjoying, but the result is that we'll ha- we have to suffer for performing what are sinful activities. In the hedonistic society, there's no consideration of what is sin. They don't think that anything sinful. Just like even uh, what, two, three generations, maybe maximum two, three generations ago, there was a sense of that, uh, a sense of dignity in dealings between men and women. That there should that ladies should they should be respected, and the idea of sexual contact outside of marriage was considered something very bad. This. Uh, there was one king of England, or he married a, I think it was king, or he was going to be king, and he married a divorced woman in, in the 1930s. And that was considered something very, very bad. By the, by, and then he had to uh, forego his claim to the crown, and then his younger brother. But now, now the, the, the Prince Charles, he married a, divorced woman and all his brothers and sisters are all divorced also and it's just considered normal values have changed but in in human society even in the western countries previously that was considered something very bad but the idea has changed is changed because or the concept has changed because the idea is that well we only have one life so we should enjoy it as much as possible it's it all comes from atheism and so if you're not happy with one partner, then just change to another one. When I was a child, I remember a chi- as a child, there was a famous song which somehow or other stuck in my mind all these years. But it was, it was a bit of a, it was a bit radical at the time, like many of the songs uh, in our childhood during the 60s and youth in the 70s. The different values were coming in, free love and all this. So there was one song saying that, uh, please release me, let me go. Uh, to waste our lives would be a sin, so release me and let me love again. In other words, I, I used to love you, I, can't, it's, uh, I used to love you, but I don't anymore. So, you know, let's just, let's not waste our lives, let's find someone else. And so it seems to make sense. If we don't know that 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 marriage is a in every culture it's been a religion a religious sacrament it's not nowadays they say well it's just a piece of paper it's a con it's a contract and actually it is in many cases and I heard in America and many people before they get married they make a contract that well just in case we happen to get divorced <laughs> then to save all the to save all the legal difficulties later will make a contract. So they're already preparing before they even get married to get divorced. So, because the idea is that there's no idea that marriage is meant for, it's it's actually in every culture, it's a religious sacrament and it's considered in the eyes of God. I don't know exactly in Buddhism how they perceive it because they don't have any God, but still they, they have a religious ceremony. So the idea is that uh, that it's not just coming together for sense enjoyment, but for it's within its religious ceremony, it's, and it's sacrosanct. It's not something to be broken whimsically. But the the symptom of the those who are engaged in sangsparsaja bhoga, those who consider the sen- sense enjoyment to be the purpose of life, then uh, then their values change. Then anything is acceptable. As long as it as long as it gives sense enjoyment and doesn't harm others. That's but they don't again, they don't know that how they are harming. And the harming goes on and on more and more and more. So that there are big wars 
and on the individual level also, one, the, those who are engaged in uh, sense enjoyment without understanding the higher purpose of life, then they have to uh, suffer for sinful reactions. But pashanapina pashati, they see, but they don't see. Because it means they see with the eyes, but they don't see through the eye. Real seeing means through the eye of Shastra. Without, with, but they don't have faith. Ya Shastra vidimutsrija vartate kama karataha nasasitim avapati nasukam naparangatim. Those who uh, do not, those, those who act whimsically, simply, I want to do it, therefore I should do it. Kama karata, impelled by desire, not impelled by Shastra vidhi, not impelled by the rules of scripture. They, when they when they're deciding to perform an action, the the criterion is: Do I like? Does it appeal to me? Not: Is it proper? Should I do it? Is it according to shastra? So such persons nasasid him; they cannot attain perfection, nor even happiness. They think I shall become happy by doing so, and certainly not the supreme destination. In, uh, I don't know in Switzerland, but in, in uh, especially in America, we do some program, and often people come afterwards and say, well, I really enjoyed it. And that's, that means that they're appreciating it. Oh, I really enjoyed the program. But, but it's not really meant for your, but they, for your enjoyment, but they measure everything. It's an appreciation. Yeah, Here, it's very good. I really enjoyed it. That that's the criterion. That if it's enjoyable, then it's good. But it's not. Re- of course, Krishna consciousness is enjoyable. But we didn't do it as in the program wasn't meant for your entertainment. <laughs> that you come and well, that's a different kind of enjoyment. You know, most of the time we have hamburger enjoyment and movie enjoyment, and this time we had jumping up and down, chanting Hare Krishna enjoyment. <laughs> so it's another kind of enjoyment. It's fun, but real enjoyment comes when we understand that it's not meant for our enjoyment, it's meant for Krishna's enjoyment. Of course, in the very beginning stages, it may be presented like that. But then, I'm just offering that as an example of how the whole society is just based on, if I enjoy it, it's good. If you don't enjoy it, it's not good. In, in Thailand, the whole culture is based on sanup. The word is sanup. It means sense pleasure. So everything's based on sense pleasure that even if someone goes to a business meeting they come back they won't ask well was it good did you make contacts they'll say sanup mai was it was it fun <laughs> that's the uh, that's why the business in thailand is mostly run by the chinese they're more, they're more serious about earning money but the Chi- the thai is in a, just enjoy enjoy life it's a sinful place as is well known. Yeah, it's interesting because in in that country, uh, for a girl to be a prostitute is not con- it's not considered socially reprehensible. It's you know it's one way of earning money. That's all. It's it's, it's not considered a bad thing. So this. Uh, Sangsparshajab, Sangsparshajab hoga is the cause of suffering. We think it's the cause of pleasure. Everyone thinks. It is the cause of enjoyment, but not pleasure. Ramat, nateshu, ramate, there are different words here. One is bhoga, one is enjoyment, and the other is ramate. He enjoys. Enjoyment. Uh, no, not ramate. Well, it's a similar word, but it's be, the, the sense of Pleasure being something different from simply the interaction of the senses with their objects. The Prabhupada quotes two verses in the purport which contrast the two, the, the pleasure of spiritually advanced people with the pleasure of foolish people or not spiritual. Ramante yogi no nante, yogis, those who are interested in the 
higher truth, Satyananda Chiratmani. Ramante, they enjoy. Satyana, iti rama padena so param brahma vidhiyate. The, the highest truth is known as rama. And the yogis, they take pleasure in rama. The supreme, who is the satyananda, genuine pleasure. He is not false pleasure. The pleasure of this material world. It's, it's called false. Why? Because it doesn't, there is pleasure in the material world, that example of the drop of water, but it is, it is, uh, incomplete. It's tuchavat, that, yan maitun adi grihamedi sukham hi tucham. It's very insignificant. Is it that? Grihamedi suk, the pleasure of, here it's said here, materialistic family life, material enjoyment, beginning with uh, sexual enjoyment. It's very insignificant. And at the same time, it's temporary. It doesn't last very long. Even if you think, well, it's insignificant, but it's not much, but it's something, and I'm enjoying it, but it doesn't last. And it's dukayonia. It's the cause of more suffering than the pleasure. So you get a little pleasure. It's like, you know, the monkey eats the banana and then he goes, poof, gets banged on the head with a mallet. At the same time, he's eating, eating the banana. Poof, that's pleasure. Poof, and then he gets hit on the head. So, pleasure is there of eating the banana, but the, the, the result is more distress. So pleasure is there, but he gets more distress. So, material existence is quite severe. You go to the restaurant or eating at home. And would you like a little bit more beef? Yeah, all right. That little bit more beef means he just signed a contract for another th- few thousands of lifetimes in suffering. So it's a little bit of pleasure and a lot of suffering. But Satyananda, true pleasure, is in Rama. Rama means Krishna. Of course, Rama is well known as the Incan or another form of Krishna, but Rama is another name for Krishna, the reservoir of pleasure. Rama, Ramante, Ramate. Pleasure, actual pleasure, genuine pleasure. That is, so that is described in the next verse that Prabhupada quotes Brahma Sokyam Tvanantam, spiritual pleasure that is without any end or limit. That is contrasted. Nayam deho deha bhajam viloke. Don't try for that. Having attained this human form of life, don't try for that kind of pleasure which is experienced on the bodily platform. And ah, that's another reason here. Rishabdev says, kashtam. That pleasure, to get that little bit of pleasure, it, it gives you trouble afterwards, but even to get it in the first place, one has to take so much trouble. There's so much difficulty to get it. There's so much difficulty to get it. And then when you get it, it it's not very pleasurable. And it gives more distress. And it's temporary. You know, the whole thing's a disaster. That's called human life. Uh, or material life. Kashtan, karma. So it's called, Prahlad Maharaj says, Shuti Suk. It's, Advertise, we hear, yes, uh, buy a lager and drink it, and then you'll be, it's advertised, and we hear, oh yeah, that'll make me, that's a good idea, okay. And then we, we do it, but there's no happiness there. Or buy this car, or buy this toothpaste, and then the beautiful young woman in the advertisement will jump out at you, and you <laughs> buy this toothpaste, and when's she coming, when's she coming? <laughs> So we're imagining that if I use this toothpaste, that the beautiful young woman in the photo or someone like that will come, but she doesn't come. And if she does come, it's also a form of suffering. So we're, we're imagining. It's ima- Shuti Sukh means imagined happiness. The happiness is in the imagination, but in the reality, it's suffering beginning, middle, and end. Adyantavanta kontaya, in the beginning and the end. It's simply, it, 
cause of suffering. Even when we even start to think about sense enjoyment, it's a disturbance in the heart. So, on both ways. And, and then afterwards, also, this Prabhupada sometimes gave the example of Dili Kaladu, Jo Kaya Wo Pistaya, Jo Nakaya Wo Bhi Pistaya. Dili Kaladu means Ladu, kind of sweet from Delhi. It's slang means a prostitute, actually. <laughs> so who has enjoyed means the people from the country, they come to Delhi and they, there's some things you can get in Delhi, maybe not in the village. So that's one of them. So those who have enjoyed, they're lamenting. that, Well, I enjoyed, but now I've got venereal disease. Or or they're thinking, oh, that was, I enjoyed, but uh, you know, it only lasted for a short time, and now, now I don't have money. Now I have to go work and get some more, and then I can enjoy. And who didn't? They're also who didn't enjoy. They're also lamenting. Oh, he enjoyed, but I didn't enjoy. So like that, we're we're envious of those who have in, who have greater capacity than us to enjoy. And those who have greater capacity to enjoy, they're very proud. Oh, I'm bigger, I'm better than you. I'm driving a, a, a BMW and you're just driving a Volkswagen. So, just see, I'm better than you. Then the Rolls Royce comes past. Oh, and it becomes so. So this is, material life is just, showing one's ability to enjoy increases one's prestige. But to maintain that prestige, it's also always a form of anxiety. These are basic points that we discuss. It's actually not, it's not spiritual life in and of itself to discuss this. But when we discuss this, then we should become Buddha. Nateshu Ramate Buddha. We should become intelligent enough to understand that this is, this is not for my actual benefit. Because Maya is calling. We take up Krishna consciousness and Maya says, well, you know, it's not so bad. You know, material life is not so bad. So, Why don't you just try another time? Just another time. How many just another times have we been through? At least 8,400,000. Just another times. So Maya is calling. But remember, we can be... As long as we're not fully attracted to Krishna, then it's good to remember those who are. Who, this, uh, in the previous verse, Prabhupada is quoted, Yadavadhi mama cheta krishna padara vinde nava nava rasa dhavan yudhyatang rantama sit Tadavadi Bhattanari Sangame Smaryamani Smaryamane Bhavati Mukha Vikara Mukha my lips curl with this Sushta Nisthivanamcha. Now I'm enjoying I mean I'm in experiencing the pleasure of being in Krishna consciousness, ever fresh pleasure on the transcendental platform. So when I think back of how I used to enjoy in the association of women, my lips curl with distaste and I spit at the thought. So as long as we're not spitting at the thought of material enjoyment, it's very valuable for us to uh, remember with our intelligence, fix our intelligence by understanding that our real position, our, our real, a real benefit, our real enjoyment is giving up the idea of our own enjoyment and simply acting for Krishna's pleasure. And that, the attempt to enjoy material life, material pleasure in any way, is simply a cause of suffering. We can experience, just eat a little bit too much. Of course, as long as one's body is young, the digestive fire is very strong, but one gets a little bit older. Eat a little bit too much, you have to suffer. <laughs> and then, if we, 
But if we go on, nevertheless, we go on stuffing our bodies day after day, then we suffer so many diseases. So just a little thing, just eat a little bit too much, then what to speak of indulging in gross sensual pleasures? But people, they, they, very difficult for them to hear. It's like, for them to hear this is, is like poison for their ears. Horrible. They, they think it's horrible. They'll see the pictures on TV of children being blasted to pieces in Lebanon, so I'm told. I haven't been watching TV for the last quite a few years. But we're told you can, you can see live broadcast all the latest goo falling out of someone's body. So they'll say, well, that's horrible. And as they're watching the TV news, eating their hamburger, they don't see the connection. And if you try to point it out, they become angry. No, we're good people. I donate to the Red Cross. I'm a good person. Their, their, their idea of what is good is, is based on their humanistic definition, atheistic definition. It doesn't do any harm. Well, it only harms the animals, but anyway, they're given by nature for us to enjoy. No, not even thinking very deeply, philosophically. So, philosophical inquiry begins, atato brahma jignasa, begins when one realizes that in material life there is no pleasure. It's simply full of suffering. So this instruction of Krishna in Bhagavad Gita is a basic instruction. It's not spiritual in itself, but it forms the platform by which one can begin to inquire into spiritual life. So, And it's a basic part of our preaching among devotees and attempt to speak to the non-devotees and inform them of this also. There was many years ago, maybe 25 years ago, Hridayananda Maharaj was on some TV program in America and there was some discussion and there was, a, there was discussing with some man, I don't know what he was, with, but and there was a moderator. So Hridayananda Maharaj was saying, well, birth, death, old age and disease are miserable and I was saying, no, it's not miserable and, and Hridayan Nanamaraj is saying, well, actually, death is miserable and disease is miserable. I said, no, no, it's not. And the moderator stepped in and said, look, he's supposed to be neutral. He said, of course, no, you, you have to accept, they are miserable. <laughs> <laughs> so he's supposed to be neutral, but it's, it's an axiom that these things are miserable. <clears throat> Prabhupada also, there's that, you can, you can hear this lecture, it's 1966 in New York, in which some some presumably a hippie is <coughs> is saying that Prabhupada saying material life is miserable and he's saying it's not miserable and Prabhupada's explaining to him birth, death, disease is miserable and then he gives his what he the hippie gives his so called very intelligent reply Well what do you mean by disease? I says, Oh, you don't know what disease means? You never had any disease? Like measles, mumps. <laughs> you ever had a? You say, so that was that was not miserable. Yeah, <laughs> reluctantly admitting. You don't want to. You don't want even to admit. So yeah, but when it's over, you can enjoy again. So foolish. The one who can begin to understand this can begin to. Look for something higher. Unfortunately, in many cases, they still miss the point. The point is that we're supposed to act for the pleasure of Krishna. But many persons, even they accept that material life is miserable, they go off on a different, at a different angle. Into and they think, well, material life is the attempt to enjoy is 
the source of suffering. So we'll just end all attempts at interaction of the the interaction of the senses with the sense objects is the cause of suffering. So stop it altogether. No more senses. Be- impersonal liberation. Just close everything. Just close up everything. No more seeing, touching, tasting, smelling, feeling, hearing, thinking. Stop it all. And become God. That's, that's an, it, it's, it's, as the English saying is there, out of the frying pan into the fire. It's no improvement, actually. Because it's still based on the same disease mentality of I shall enjoy. Because I'm not in, the disease is our not wanting to serve Krishna and contribute to his enjoyment. So therefore we're trying to enjoy separately from him. And the impersonalists, they find, I don't get any enjoyment in material life, so I, I will enjoy better by just not doing anything. So it's still a search for enjoyment. It's like, why do people commit suicide? Because they're thinking, I'm so miserable, so better not be miserable. Just cease to exist. So they think, I, then my attempts to enjoy are failed, so I'm only experiencing suffering, so just stop everything. Because they don't know they have to become a ghost and suffer so much for their sinful activity of suicide. But it's the, the basis of their, mot- their, their motivation is how I shall be happy. And rejecting the principle of serving Krishna, making him happy. So this is the beginning and the, the, the the beginning of, or, or the, the basis on which one can begin to enter into spiritual life is understanding that material enjoyment is the cause of suffering. But then one has to go up and understand that life, everything is meant for Krishna's pleasure. So this in, in and of itself is not spiritual. But it's an essential understanding. Otherwise, we can even take up bhakti for our own enjoyment. And then it, then it's not bhakti. We think it's bhakti. It seems to be. But it's not actually. Because it's done for our own enjoyment. Because we do bhakti because we think it makes me happy, therefore I do it. So these are some basic principles which are well worth discussing. Because we're all attracted to enjoying the senses. And it's very difficult to get out of this mentality. It's a long-standing addiction, which we all have to get cured from. So, Hare Krishna. That's how to get the cure. Say Hare Krishna. So, is there any question? Yes, there is. Um, I think the example today, uh, when Hare Krishna is marrying together, having family together, there is a high percentage of divorce. Yes, it's not good. My question is, isn't it uh, that we can find a, a balance? Or what is the missing point in education? How to really bring the higher taste of the understanding that also Griasta life can be also enjoyable, but Krishna. Yeah, if it's what is the cause of this? Um, well, it's a very big topic, but I've I've thought about it a lot and discussed it a lot with many devotees. It's something that's high on my agenda, actually. Uh, one reason is uh, being influenced by the broader society around us. That's that's a major factor, in which it's considered. Okay, there, there's no social restriction as there used to be in society. Um, and an- another reason may be the uh, misunderstanding of what are the princi- what are the principles of family life, that it's a responsibility. And when you take it up, you have to see it through. And the uh, misunderstanding of the principle of renunciation, that... Well, one is not feeling very... One's experiencing suffering in family life. I mean, there are difficulties. Even in, even in the happiest of marriages, 
by, by its very nature, there are difficulties. So, but one has to go through that responsibly. So, uh, but then the idea, well, there's, it's difficult, so all of a sudden you feel very renounced. And you think, well, actually this is all maya, and I should leave it. But they're feeling it's all maya, they, they, because actually they're not feeling the happiness that they expected. So it's, it's a false renunciation. It's, it is maya, but it's more maya to give it up irresponsibly. As, and using renunciation as an excuse. So uh, a lot of preaching is needed about this. It's, it's a very serious and bad situation in our movement, which actually creates so much suffering, creates so much distress, because those who do divorce, it, you know, it's not that they find any pleasure in doing so. And it creates distress, especially if there are children. I have a question for the pujari. Do you have one or two minutes? You have two minutes. Why do you offer incense to the deities? What's the purpose? Yeah, why? The, I offer incense. Yeah, but why? To help the take off less. Mm-hmm. Take off less incense. Mm-hmm. Because the uh, aroma that they have. Yeah, okay. Because the aroma. That's because Krishna likes it, huh? Why do you extinguish it after offering it? Because to him. But it's but it's nice, isn't it? You're offering it because Krishna likes it. It's too heavy for who? Yes, everything they offer for me to handle. But but it's for Krishna's pleasure, right? Yeah, it's for me to handle. Yeah, but it's not being offered for your pleasure. It's being offered for Krishna's pleasure. In the in the Raja Yeah, but why not all the time? Because it's for his pleasure. And if you don't like it, that's not the criteria. Not after all, it's kink. It's still kink. Hmm? Kink. Kink. Chemical. Well, why don't you get some natural incense? <laughs> the point is, it's meant for Krishna's pleasure, so... Actually, the nice thing is to keep incense burning throughout the day. That we always used to do. But nowadays they just yeah, extinguish it. We, we keep sometimes, we, keep, we save some incense for devotees, that sometimes devotees they want to have some Maha incense to bring at home. Yeah, well, in that case, they should have some separately offered, isn't it? Because that which is offered is meant for Krishna's pleasure. So you could maybe offer, give a packet and then ask the pujari to offer one or two sticks and then the rest you can take as prasad, something like that. But I see it's very common. The, the devotees don't like it and so they put it out. But it's not whether you like it or not is not the consideration. And actually if your senses become purified then you'll like what Krishna likes also. <laughs> because in, that's spiritual, in the spiritual world yeah, all these things are there, what Krishna likes. So, for instance, if we prefer blue jeans, then and we're attached to blue jeans. I'm just giving the example. I didn't, I didn't notice you had blue jeans. It's, uh, or, you know, or red jeans or whatever. Then uh, if, if, we, if we like that dress better, that might be an obstacle for us to go into the spiritual world because they don't wear them there. So this culture is... We also wear anyway. So this culture is, this Krishna conscious culture is to help to prepare us for our eternal existence. It's all based on acting in a manner that is pleasing to Krishna. It's a big topic. It's an important one. I just saw a letter from Dhanavya Maharaj. He's contemplating making a book of interviews with disciples of Prabhupada who have remained married all these years and you know, as an inspiration. Because those who get married, presumably they do so with the idea of living happily throughout their lives. But then we see in so many cases they don't. Personally, I think um, a lot of the problems starts when they talk about we, we're trying to make our marriage work. As soon as I hear someone say that, I know it's finished. Because if you're thinking of making your marriage work, that means you've allowed the 
possibility of it not working, and then you're going to split. But if you just if you just go in with the idea that anyway we're here together, and even if you throw everything at each other every day, we're going to stay together, then you don't throw everything at each other every day. I, it's a funny thing, once a few years ago in Russia, one couple came to me. I've never seen them before in my life. Young devotee couple. And they said, well, we'd like your blessings to get divorced. <laughs> and I said, forget it. Don't divorce. It's nonsense. So they said, they had enough respect for me. They said, oh, really? I said, yeah, really, you have to stay together. So I said, oh, okay. And now they're going on, you know, it's like 10 years, 12 years later. And, you know, they, they just adjusted to the fact that they have to stay together. And they had another kid. And, you know, life's going on. And it's not so miserable as they thought. They're not as... Because if they think, well, we have to live together, then they live to, then they adjust to each other in a way that they won't, you know, cause... They won't be so bad to each other or whatever. But if they're thinking there's the possibility that we can sp split up, then then they follow that. So just to even have the idea that we can divorce, if you have that idea, then it's very likely to happen. You shouldn't even think of it. And of course, there are so many things. We need the whole culture should be there. It has to be training. In traditional societies, young married couples, they didn't have freedom. They were... They're saying that women don't have independence, but the men didn't either. The men were also, until they've, the head of the family is the grandfather, and the father might be 70 years old, but he's still under his father. And what to speak of two generations down, they're married, but they're, above them is their father, their grandfather, maybe their great-grandfather. So no one had independence, practically, unless you, and then until you become very old and respond. And even then, in, the, the old men in the village, they're also, if they do anything wrong, which by that age you hope they wouldn't be, but uh, there's also the the elders of the village will come together. It was a con but there's a lot of control in society. But as I was saying earlier in the lecture, that control is good because without control, we go out of control. And we, and we just indulge us. To help us control our senses and to live responsibly, then control is concerned required. It's irresponsible, this idea of everyone should have as much freedom as they want. It's actually a very irresponsible proposition. It's based on the supposition that people are basically uh, good and wise and will act in a manner which is good for themselves and others, but it's not true. Without training, without guidance and without control, then uh, will tend towards animalism. So this idea that everyone should have freedom, it's actually a disaster for human society. They wanted, this idea came up with the French Revolution. What is it? Liberté, égalité, fraternité. But, because uh, they were under the control of people who would watch them starve and tell them, let them eat cake. The famous saying of Marie Antoinette, or however it's pronounced. We English people don't know how to say French words. We're proud of it, of not being able to pronounce French. So uh, she was famous for that, for which uh, Monsieur Guillotine had a solution <laughs> to Marie Antoinette's proposition, let them eat cake. But the the... the they rejected the control of people who were exploiting. And this whole idea, women's liberation, has come up on the idea that we're being exploited. Of course, Prabhupada said, better to be exploited by one man than by every man. That uh, if there's control, there's the possibility of exploitation. And without spiritual principles, there will be exploitation in human society. But they can't imagine that a woman or a citizen can be controlled for their benefit. They can't imagine that there can be such a situation. But that is the Vedic culture, that there's enlightened kings and women are not given liberty, but they are protected and looked after and respected, which is a much better situation than you know, fighting... It, liberty for everyone means everyone is competing with everyone else. 
And the more liberty, the less cooperation. Cooperation means we submit to others. So these are all very big topics. About this point of uh, religious family life in Vedic culture, well, I wrote a book about that. I made a book about... It doesn't directly or philosophically... Or, well, it does, but not. it doesn't systematically address this point, but it gives a, a, a written picture of how the Vedic culture works very nicely, as, as nicely as possible in a bad world. Actually, the Van Ashram system, it's also not the best system. <laughs> the Van Ashram system is for, for people of lesser caliber. The original system was no system, anarchy, full liberty. But that was in the Satya Yuga when everyone was of Hangsa Jati, they were all, everyone was so highly spiritually enlightened that they didn't, then for then there was, but anarchy for them means perfect order because they're highly spiritually enlightened. But then when people come down from the level of being Paramahamsas, then they need a social system. So the Varnashram is the social system for, it's the best social system for regulating imperfection. You want to show that book? You have them here? I'm writing books on Prabhupada's order and therefore I'm trying to distribute them also because what's the point of writing them unless you distribute them? <laughs> <laughs> and they have their people are appreciated. This is the uh, Vedic culture one. Interviews with devotees who, and plus my own experiences. Devotees who are uh, raised in traditional Indian life, which, if you want to see it, you better get on your Swiss Air flight immediately to India because it's going down day by day, very fast. You're all from Sri Lanka, is it? Originally? From? From Switzerland, okay. I see. Persian, I see. So, uh, in Sri Lanka, I heard, I haven't been there, I heard that the culture is still quite strong. It means they're not as advanced as India, materially. And that's, uh, that's one major reason why the Islamic world is not happy with America. This They call the great Satan, because they don't want to see their family traditions and everything broken down. Because this gross materialism, it just, by this idea that I, I should enjoy, my enjoyment is the main thing, is immediately family life is destroyed. Because family life is based on uh, mutual sharing and giving and responsibility. But then, if the most important thing is my enjoyment, then you see, it's very common. A man, he's 45 years old, married for 20 years, has three children, and he thinks, oh, my wife's getting old, my secretary, she, she's young and beautiful. So <laughs> that's the end of his family life, because he thinks my enjoyment is more important than my, my wife of 20 years and my children. It's all based on this idea that we life is meant for enjoyment. My own enjoyment, my own individual enjoyment is more important than anything. But more important is responsibility, duty, or as dharma, the word is there, dharma, which means more than duty and more than responsibility, but it certainly encompasses that. So that's there, that's one of the books. And I've written other books also, which are available here, if you want to take. You have to give a donation. That's also part of the dharma. If you, yeah. Which is also, uh, you speak about responsibility. Um, as leaders of each country, mm -hmm. uh, or leaders of our own life, I mean, it's also a responsibility to give training and support. Yeah. Even support for Kriyastas also. Technical? Technical and devotional support also. Yeah, yeah. That's true. Prabhupada wanted, Prabhupada saw 
he could see that most of his disciples were going to be married and he wanted and, and for the benefit of the whole world, not only his disciples but to make but he wanted to establish Varnashram communities. That's Prabhupada's solution. If family if, if Grihastas have to take shelter economically of the demoniac society, then they get sucked into its its values and the whole way of life. There's no they, they have to work so hard to make enough money to live and they they don't have time for sadhana and their bad association and they adopt the values. It's very difficult to be Krishna conscious in when you're intimately mixed up with a society which has completely different values. So these are some of the considerations. Yeah. We have a lot of work to do. A lot of work. Well, the beginning is talking about it. The next thing is doing. But even even in this situation where devotees are economically compromised, still, it, it doesn't mean that one is obliged to give up the sense of dharma. There are devotees who have maintained religious principles within family life. And despite being economically dependent on the broader society. And we see that devotees coming from Indian backgrounds, they, so far, most of them, because they, they still have that background culture, so, so, so far they're still, they're, be, they're doing better in terms of family life than Western devotees who are brought up in a culture in which well, our generation, the, the idea of free sex was brought in, which is, uh, it's a social disaster, actually. But it seemed like a very good thing at the time. And still, still, uh, that's, the, that's like the basic principle of modern society. What were you going to say? No, I was asking, when you said there should be financial systems set up, uh, should not financial systems with other, other non vaishnavas and actually give an example or just like them or give them something. Prabhupada's idea of setting up Varnashram communities is that devotees should set the example and then non-devotees who want to f- take advantage of that can join and naturally they'll become devotees also. That's why Prabhupada said people will join. If we set up these farms, communities, Varnashram, farm communities, Prabhupada said people will join in their millions. The challenge is still there. That we haven't done it doesn't mean, well, it's a failure in one sense, but it's not a complete failure because the possibility to do it is still there. Just like Prabhupada was told by his spiritual master to preach in English. So Prabhupada said, well, I, I didn't do it for so many years, but he said, I never, I never forgot that order. It's not that he was against doing that order, but just the the possibility or the circumstance to do it hadn't arisen. So he did it, but it took some time to do it. So we can still do it. As Prabhupada some